the Nazi rings that bind them all. A medieval plague and the horrific hellhole that spawned it. How London was saved by a dream. And a Marie Celeste mystery with a sting in its tail. A new kind of war, conflict on a scale never seen before or since. This is war at its weirdest. Incredible experiments. This has got to be one of the most bizarre weapons in the history of warfare. What is even crazier is it seems to work. <sighs> Mysterious mm. events. It does sound crazy, but we have eyewitnesses that claim that's what happened. Unexplained phenomena. They've never seen anything like this before. When a world goes to war with itself, things get really weird. The Ring of the Nibelungs. Wagner's most famous opera. And a touchstone for the Nazis. The Nazis are obsessed with Wagner's ring. To them, this ring of power forged by the dwarf Alberic represents the destiny of the Nordic Aryan race to rule the world. Rings that can grant you power are an integral part of Nordic mythology, and they've captivated writers ever since. Although they seem very different, Wagner's Ring Cycle and Tolkien's Lord of the Rings are actually both steeped in Nordic mythology. One Nazi in particular was gripped by the power of the rings. Himmler sees these rings as potent symbols of his sinister super soldiers. His SS stormtroopers wear silver death's head rings to mark their special purpose. There were thousands of these rings that were deposited at Vevelsberg Castle. We know that they existed, but at the end of the war, poof, they disappear like a vapor. They're gone, and to this day, no one's found them. What is the secret of Himmler's precious rings? Nineteen thirty-four. In Germany, the Nazis have a firm grip on power. At the Nuremberg rally, hundreds of thousands turn out to salute their chancellor, Adolf Hitler. Soldiers in black uniforms spearhead the stormtrooper legions, celebrating the thousand-year Reich. They are the Nazis' elite troops, the Schutzstaffel, or SS. It's not just their sinister uniforms that set the SS apart. They are driven by a dark ideology, born from a twisted vision of German history. Within the German military, the Schutzstaffel, the SS, was recognized as being elite, populated by men who were super soldiers. They're trying to establish themselves as an almost mystical order of knights, men of supposedly Aryan purity who regard all other races as being inferior. Untermension, they call them. And under this new ideology, these Untermension would all be eradicated. To be part of this new order, you have to prove that you are racially pure. And as you progress through the ranks, you have to perform these more and more elaborate pagan rituals. The ritualization of the SS provides a direct connection to the founding father of the SS and his belief in the occult, Heinrich Himmler. Himmler even designed Nordic pagan rituals to take the place of weddings, Christmas, baptisms, because he saw all of those ceremonies as heavily tainted by Judeo-Christianity. Even the symbol of the SS itself, the two lightning flash sig runes, are based on ancient Nordic writing. As part of this unholy order, Himmler has powerful totems made for SS officers to bind them to the cause. There's a ceremonial sword, a dagger, and a Tottenkopf ring, a death's head ring. It's a skull and crossbones covered in mystical symbols. 
For Himmler, these rings went back to Thor, the ancient Nordic god of war, and they were his ring of power. It was so powerful that the ring was more important than the individual, the death's head on it, providing a symbol that a member of the SS owed an allegiance. He had an honor binding to the SS until death. The lead acolytes of the SS cult received the rings in person from their high priest, Heinrich Himmler. But there's a blood price to pay. When the wearer dies, the ring they are bound to must return to their dark lord. These rings aren't simply just tossed out to members of the SS. Each one has the recipient's name engraved on it, um, and it has inside Himmler's signature. And there are oak leaves as well, which represent the SS's commitment to their ideology and their faith in their ultimate victory. Himmler needs a base for his SS that will act as the repository for the rings, a shrine to his deathless heroes. In 1934, he chooses a remote castle in the heart of Germany, Wevelsberg. If you are a gruesome individual like Heinrich Himmler, then you essentially need a lair to lurk in. And for this purpose, he locates this dark, dark castle called Wevelsberg. Wevelsberg is this triangular-shaped fortress on top of a rock, and it has a very sinister past, a place of witch trials and executions. But what it's seen in the past is absolutely nothing compared to what Himmler intends to do to the place when he gets there. He wants it to become an occult temple, the center of Nazi mythology. He wants to build up a huge complex, a dark center of, of a Nazi web. The SS were going to be the soldiers and priests that would make it happen there. He transforms the castle to fulfill his dark vision, condemning a dedicated concentration camp to the Death's Head cause. This wouldn't be the Nazis if there wasn't some form of, of terror involved, and so all of the work is carried out by slave labor force, and they're basically forced to work until they drop. These poor slaves were kept in appallingly inhumane conditions. There, some 4,000 prisoners were worked, many of them to their deaths. The result of their efforts is a dark Camelot, a mythic base for the SS cult. It's like Himmler can't quite decide which way he wants to go with the interior of this place. It's like a cluster bomb of various mythologies. In one room, there's a huge black sun emblazoned on the floor. In every way, it looks like a set designer came in and created something that would look medieval, where Germanic knights would meet. Rooms throughout the castle are named after myths and legends associated with the hunt for the grail and King Arthur. In one of the towers, a water cistern is even converted into a crypt for pagan rituals. And then randomly, there's, there's a round table with 12 chairs around it. He's really not leaving any stone of the occult unturned. At the heart of the castle, lurks the shrine to the holders of the Death's Head Ring. This will form an eternal monument to his fallen super-soldiers. Himmler doesn't believe that once these rings have been given out to the recipients, they're theirs to keep. What he believes, genuinely believes, is that if one of his super-soldiers is killed in action, then the ring must be returned to Wevelsberg and he has a shrine for these rings where he collects them. Each ring providing a symbol of an individual who laid down his life in the protection of the right. And he thinks that he can draw on the power exuding from these rings and effectively wield the power of all these SS men that have died wearing them. A 
As the war drags on, the Death's Head rings begin to earn their name. Right from the beginning of the Second World War in 1939, the SS are at the heart of the action. But, of course, if you're on the front line, you're going to lose men, they're going to die. And as these SS men die, their comrades remove their Tottenkopf rings, and these rings are sent back to Wevelsburg. Himmler soon starts to amass one hell of a collection. By 1945, Nazi Germany has lost lots of ground. It begins to look like there's no possibility that the Third Reich can survive. Himmler is convinced that his rings of power must be hidden away, ready for a time when the Nazis will rise again. Even though the war is clearly lost, Himmler is thinking on a slightly different plane, a different sort of level. In Himmler's head, he absolutely cannot let the power of all of these rings fall into the hands of the Allies. Himmler spirits the Death's Head rings from the shrine and entombs them in a secret crypt deep in the heart of a mountain. He does this for the specific reason that he wants the rings to charge with totemic power under the mountain, ready to help the Third Reich rise again. He orders the castle destroyed, but the dark fortress stubbornly refuses to fall. It's almost as if the fortress itself is resisting attempts to bring it down. When the American 3rd Armored Division storm the castle, they find it deserted. The SS guards have taken on new forms and assimilated themselves into the unsuspecting population. To this day, the resting place of Himmler's rings remains a darkly kept secret. There's every reason to believe that there might be a crate of thousands of SS honor rings somewhere in the back of a cave. So all of that immense power housed in these missing rings is out there somewhere waiting to be found. Coming up, as the war turns against Japan, its scientists go to any lengths to find a wonder weapon. They would carry out all manner of inhumanity and savagery against these prisoners of war. What they come up with is truly horrific. As crazy as it sounds, it appears the Japanese have weaponized the bubonic plague. The Black Death. The very name conjures up images of pain and suffering. The bubonic plague is one of the greatest scourges that humankind has ever had to endure. And during the Second World War, the Japanese weaponize it. At the start of the war, Japan unleashed a medieval plague upon the people of China. But China is only the start. Japan's next target is mainland USA. October 1940. Residents in Ningbo on China's east coast run for cover as Japanese bombers fly overhead. But on this occasion, all is not as it seems. The residents of Ningbo assume that they're going to be bombarded with bombs. But when they look up, they don't see explosives coming down. They see cardboard boxes. As the boxes broke apart in the airflow as they fell out of the aircraft, a little cloud of smoke trailed out of this box. And so their first thought was that maybe it was some sort of chemical that was being dropped on them. But it was not a chemical weapon. It was a biological weapon. The strange cloud eventually dissipates, leaving the townspeople confused and unharmed, or so they think. 
Over the next few days, a mass sickness sweeps through the town. People complain of aching lymph nodes, glandular swellings and a high fever. And shortly after that, people start dying. The incident has all the hallmarks of a terrifying plague. The residents of Ningbo start dropping like flies. Entire families are wiped out, and the bodies all have huge bubo swellings under their armpits. This can only mean one thing. As awful as it sounds, it seems that the Japanese have managed to weaponize bubonic plague, and they're dropping it over China. The plague bomb is the brainchild of microbiologist Shiro Ishii, founder of the notorious warfare research lab, Unit 731. Unit 731 was a really, really horrific place. Think of the worst thing you can do to another human being and then multiply it a million times. That was Unit 731. The Japanese would take Chinese prisoners of war, tie them to stakes, and then expose them to these poisonous chemicals. They also have some prisoners even strapped to centrifuges and spun round and round. And on one occasion, it's said that a prisoner's eyeballs even popped out. This is a truly horrific place. They would carry out all manner of inhumanity and savagery against these prisoners of war. Top of Ishii's priority list is to see how the bubonic plague can be weaponized. The Black Death is a miserable contagion, and the way that it kills is not quick and painless. Ishii chooses the Black Death because it is one of the deadliest and most awful diseases in history. It's because it makes its victims suffer before death that he chooses it. It's because it has this voracious appetite for consuming the people that are exposed to it. He chooses it. He chooses it because his objective is to kill as many Chinese people as he can. At Unit 731, test subjects are injected with the plague to see how quickly it spreads through the body. As victims near death, they are cut open and their infected organs are harvested for further analysis. Next, the cultivated virus is passed on to swarms of fleas. As the plague virus is most commonly spread to humans through flea bites, Ishii knows that using fleas will maximize the fallout potential from his weapon. The infected swarms are packaged in containers of flour and passed on to the Imperial Japanese Air Service. Kill off, Kill off! As the aircraft is in flight, the box is tossed out. The box disintegrates in the airflow, distributing the fleas and the flour in a broad area that will attract rats, who will then be infested by the fleas, and those rats will then transmit the disease bearing fleas into the farm where people live. Even though the Ningbo experiment proved to be extremely deadly, it wasn't effective enough for Ishii. So what he develops is a ceramic bomb which can concentrate the release of plague in a far tighter area. When news of the plague bomb's success reaches Emperor Hirohito, he demands the weapon must now be used on Japan's greatest enemy, the United States of America. If he can't stop the Americans in the Pacific, Hirohito will unleash hell on Earth in the United States. On March 25th, 1945, the plan to spread the bubonic plague over the United States of America is officially approved by the Japanese military. The target is the coastal city of San Diego. The city of San Diego was chosen as a target because it is coastal, so they can reach it with their long-range submarines. It's also a city where there are important military installations. And then also it's a city with a very large population so that they can maximize the use of the weapon. 
They estimate that the disease will spread to at least tens of thousands of civilians before authorities have a chance to contain it. Under code name Operation Cherry Blossom by Night, five long-range submarines prepare to transport the flea bombs across the Pacific Ocean. Under the cover of darkness, the submarines will creep to a few miles of the US coast. Nine kamikaze pilots are set to launch from the subs before dropping their deadly cargo on the unsuspecting residents of San Diego. Everything is now ready to go. The Black Death is coming to America. Isolated from the horrors of the war, the citizens of mainland USA feel untouchable. The bubonic plague could change all that. If there had been an outbreak of bubonic plague released by one of those Japanese submarines, the entire nation would have been in an uproar. But the plague bomb is about to be trumped by something even more horrific. On the 6th of August, 1945, the American B-29 bomber, Enola Gay, drops Little Boy, the world's first atomic bomb, on the Japanese industrial city of Hiroshima. Seventy thousand people are vaporized in the firestorm, which spreads across four square miles. Three days later, a second atomic bomb, Fat Man, is dropped over Nagasaki, killing another 35,000. As if the death toll from the atomic explosion weren't enough, hundreds of thousands of Japanese are affected by radiation sickness, which will affect them and their children for generations. Japan is forced to surrender before Operation Cherry Blossom has a chance to launch. Before Japan can end the war with biological weapons, America has got there first with the weapon that is even more horrific. Coming up, a deadly new weapon threatens the city of London. The flying bomb is the latest German superweapon. It begins a reign of terror. They were hard to detect, and they could strike without warning. No one was safe. But one man's dream could help stop the flying bomb menace. This is surely one of the weirdest developments of the Second World War. New Jersey, 1940, and engineer David B. Parkinson is having a very weird night. Parkinson has this really vivid dream. He's manning an anti-aircraft gun, and he's shooting at German planes. And every time he fires, he hits a plane. It's an amazing hit rate. And then he notices on the side of the gun there's a weird gizmo. And he realizes that this is what's allowing him to hit the target. What's really astonishing about this is that Parkinson has never actually seen an anti-aircraft gun. He had no idea how they worked. Strange as it may seem, this dream will change the way that war is fought forever. And to do that, it will save the city of London. June 1944, the sky above London is shattered by a strange new sound. 
What people hear over London is a strange rumbling noise which has a sort of clockwork quality to it. No one's certain what it is. And when they see the thing, it's stubby. It's got short wings, it's got an engine. Nobody has seen or heard anything like this before. It's completely unfamiliar. They don't know what to do. The strange aircraft comes over London. Then the engine cuts out. The clockwork sound stops and everything goes silent and it just plummets, it falls like a stone. And then there's an almighty explosion. Four civilians are killed and ten injured. But it doesn't end there. More of these things soon start appearing and more and more explosions take place. It seems at first as though the Germans have sent lots of hopeless rookie pilots over London and they're just crashing their planes. Then there's a direct hit on the chapel at Wellington Barracks, which kills 121 people. It's now clear that these aren't planes crashing at all, but a new super weapon. The Germans are attacking London with the world's first cruise missile. The Germans call these deadly missiles the V-1, or vengeance weapon. But Londoners soon give them a nickname. Londoners call it the Doodlebug, named after the sound of their jet engines, which make a distinctive rumbling noise. More than 9,000 of these super weapons are fired at London. At the peak of their destructive power, 100 fall each day. Their reign of terror claims 6,000 lives. London desperately needs some way to stop the V-1 onslaught. But the new flying bombs are too speedy for conventional anti-aircraft guns. I think it would be easy to fire an anti-aircraft gun. There's a thing in the sky, you shoot at it. No, nothing like that. Plane! First, you've got two observers on either side of the gun, and they are trying to work out the altitude and the speed of the target. The observers transmit this information to the tracker, He's got to turn the hand wheel to keep the gun on target. Angle two, bearing three, five. As the hand wheels turn, a mechanical director calculates the future position of the target and adjusts the gun's range, elevation and fuses to get the perfect shot. All of this is going on within 30 seconds. And if you get it wrong, that bomb, whatever, will fall on civilians. The doodlebugs move so fast that it's hard for the anti-aircraft guns to hit them. Until a solution comes from an unlikely source. As crazy as it sounds, the best defense against the V-1 flying bombs starts off as a dream. The dream was that of David B. Parkinson. In 1940, Parkinson was developing a device for making electronic music at Bell Telephone Laboratories in New Jersey, USA. Of course, you don't really hear the sounds that are being made in the studio. If we could see it, it might look something like this. The device included a component called a resistance potentiometer, which converts these electronic sound waves into a readable form. A potentiometer is essentially a very basic form of computer that uses electrical currents to perform mathematical calculations very quickly and then transmits that to a pencil that draws waveforms on a piece of paper. Parkinson's dream makes him realise that this device doesn't just have to drive a pencil. 
If you could attach it to an anti-aircraft gun, it could make all the calculations needed in milliseconds and then guide the gun onto its target. What's really incredible is that Parkinson had only ever seen anti-aircraft guns on newsreels. He has no idea how they work. He pitched his idea to C.A. Lovell, his boss at Bell Laboratories. Lovell thought the idea had potential and passed it up the line to his superiors. Eventually, the US Army heard the proposal and agreed to fund Bell Labs to develop a new electronic gun director. Now, this is not an easy task. In order to make this thing work, Bell's technicians have to work out how to link the electronic coil of the potentiometer to the mechanical servos of the gun. This had never been done before. The design isn't perfected until April 1942, when Bell Labs come up with the Model 9, or M9, gun director. And it's not until 1944 that it proves its true worth. When he hears about the M9, Churchill immediately realises its potential. And he urgently requests to be sent to Britain to help fight against the onslaught of the V1s. Initially, the Americans are not happy to help with this problem at all. But one V1 hits three lorry loads of American servicemen and women leaving the club in Chelsea, which has been used as their headquarters. Over 100 are killed. And at that point, the M9 system becomes available to the British. American technical personnel help set up the M9s on 100 anti-aircraft batteries all around London. They're an instant success. Thanks to the M9s, some one in three V1s is shot down. And by the end of the war, that hit rate has risen to an astonishing 50%. London is saved, and warfare will never be the same again. The M9 will go on to spawn a whole new type of weapon, the surface-to-air missile, because that uses exactly the same type of technology that was developed in the M9. And it all started with a dream. Coming up, a ship runs aground off the Normandy coast. It just sails up to the shore as if no one was manning the ship. A crew vanishes at sea. The lifeboats are still in place and the table was set for supper. It sets up a dark mystery from World War I. This is a real Marie Celeste mystery. What happened to the crew? Were they swept overboard? Were they abducted? Or is the answer even stranger than that? <laughs> Ghosts, dinosaurs, strange disappearances. Oh my God. At the time of World War I, the English Channel was a dangerous place to be. There were rumours at the time that there was a huge sea monster living in the Channel. When an empty ship runs aground on the coast of Normandy, it gives birth to a dark mystery. This is a real Marie Celeste mystery. What happened to the crew? Were they swept overboard? The problem is that although the sails are slightly messed up, nothing else has been touched. The only other possible explanation is that they were abducted. The question is, by what? Seventeenth of October, nineteen seventeen, a three-masted schooner sails serenely toward the beach at Rosal Point in Normandy. According to eyewitnesses, this ship sails straight to the shore as if no one is manning the tiller. 
When the Coast Guard boards the ship, they find it eerily empty. The single lifeboat still hangs in the davits. The only sign of disturbance on board are some tangled sails. The galley fire is still burning, and the table in the mess is set for dinner. All the sailors' clothing and personal belongings are still on the ship. The logbooks indicate nothing is amiss. So where are the crew? The mystery has prompted several theories as to why the crew disappeared. The only problem is none of them quite make sense. Some sailors at the time believed that something lurked in the English Channel, waiting to pick off unsuspecting ships. There were rumours at the time that there was a huge sea monster living in the Channel. Some sailors claim to have seen something that looked like a giant squid with huge eyes. And that's not the only strange creature to be spotted during the war. In July 1915, the captain of the German submarine, the U-28, claims to have seen, as a ship is blown up, an enormous crocodile-like creature blown into the air then fell back into the debris and disappeared. The captain's description seems to match that of a mosasaur, a crocodile-like dinosaur that lived in the Cretaceous period 70 million years ago. He said at least five other people had seen the same thing. Very conveniently, all of these were killed in action before he wrote his story down. But if a monster had taken the crew, there should have been signs of a struggle. The ship was spotless, no sign that it was attacked by a mysterious monster. And even if it had been attacked by a monster, why hadn't the crew got into a lifeboat and make good their escape? The lifeboat could be a clue. It suggests that the crew did not leave the ship voluntarily. They were taken. crew didn't just dive overboard, and frankly, there's no conceivable reason why they would, then the only other possible explanation is that they were abducted. During the war, there was one kind of vessel operating in the Channel that was notorious for this kind of tactic, and that was the U-boat. By 1917, 23 U-boats operating out of Flanders were dedicated to harassing British shipping across the Channel. U-boats were coming up alongside Allied ships, taking the crew on board, effectively taking them prisoner. The U-boat would usually surface, take the crew off the boat, along with the boat's logbook, and then they'd sink the ship with the torpedo. But this doesn't appear to have happened. What happened is that the crew have been taken off the boat, but the logbook is still there. And then the boat hasn't been sunk. So if the Zabrina crew were taken by a U-boat, why then was the boat left untouched? Perhaps a clue to the answer lies in a remarkable incident which took place off the Devon coast in 1918. It involves the HMS Stock Force, a converted collier. The Stock Force is a poor little ordinary tramp steamer. She is off the coast of Devon in 1918 when a U-boat fires off her and hits her. So the crew abandon ship, jump in their lifeboat and start to escape. As they rowed away, they realised actually the vessel wasn't sinking. It had been hit, but it wasn't going to go down they decided to turn round and get back on board. The U-boat sees a prize, comes up and starts chasing them back towards the ship. It looked like a completely doomed race. There was no way a crew and a lifeboat was going to make it back to the boat before the U-boat did. Then, something remarkable happened. As the submarine closed in on the apparently doomed crew, these panels are dropped down, 
to reveal a mighty 14-inch cannon mounted on the forecastle. There are crews swarming all over the decks and they begin firing shells into the U-boat. And they pound the submarine until it sinks. Turns out the stock force wasn't any ordinary boat. It was a Q-boat. Q-boats are Britain's amazing response to the German U-boat threat. They're named Q-boats after the name of their first base in Queenstown in Ireland. What they were were very ordinary, ugly, sad-looking little tramp steamers and merchant ships that looked like easy pickings to a U-boat. But behind fake lifeboats, panels and awnings, are hidden a whole array of guns. In one boat, they even had a chicken coop on the deck under which they'd hidden a gun. And when a U-boat revealed herself, suddenly the chicken coop would fly off and the men would jump out and man a gun and open fire on the U-boat. So is it possible that the Zabrina was some weird kind of deception ship, like a Q-boat? If it was, it would have much more than the usual crew of a tramp steamer. As well as a normal crew, a Q-boat needed gunners for its hidden weapons, it needed stokers for its more powerful engines, it needed marines in case it was boarded by a U-boat. A Q-boat had dozens of men on board, not just a handful. And here is where an intriguing detail about the Zabrina casts a whole new light on its voyage that fateful October 1917. A British captain says that he saw the Zabrina at sea. And what was unusual is that it had far more than its normal complement of five. In fact, local records from the time suggest that as many as 23 people could have been on board. If it was simply a cargo vessel, five is perfectly sufficient. 23 men suggest what we've got is a Q-ship. There's just one problem. The Zubrina was completely intact when she was discovered. They found a table laid for five people, not 23. And there's no guns. A Q-ship with no guns isn't a Q-ship. Whether the Zabrina really did have more than five crew on board and what happened to them remains a mystery to this day. I would say that she had another underhand reason for leaving port with as many men as she did. Perhaps they were on a secret mission and the crew left the vessel and then it slipped its moorings. Or perhaps the crew were taken off by something we simply don't know about. Who knows? <laughs> 